So there's lots to cover, and I'm going to try and give you a reasonable idea of both the rough scale of the problem and then dive deep into the Django Pacific part of it. I could probably speak for a whole conference on this topic, but you don't want that, trust me. So let's get diving right in. First of all, I'm Andrew Godwin. Um, as I didn't say earlier, I am a Django Core developer. I work at Eventbrite, where I'm one of the senior software engineers there. Um, I used to complain about migrations a lot, but apparently they're solved now. So it's all, no, it's. <laughs> Um, Marcus, thankfully, is doing a lot of the heavy lifting on that stuff now, so I got a bit more free to look at channels. And really, a lot of you, I presume, want to know how channels work. So I have one answer for you. It's magic. Thank you. It's been a great... No. Um, it's not magic. It may seem like it at first. Um, but basically, I'm going to try and outline to you what the problem is, or sort of the context that this sits in, because for some of you, it'll be familiar. For others, it won't be a familiar problem. And then go through both my solution and thought process, which some people find interesting, and then look at the actual code that came out of that process and some of the edge cases and, and problems we have. But first of all, what is the problem? Well, the web is changing. Back in 2005, when Django was started, the web was a simpler, happier place. Their websites were static HTML with a couple of interactive bits. JavaScript was sort of a thing you used for like making the status bar animate or having snow on the page at Christmas. It wasn't very exciting. But since then, things have changed. We have rich web applications. We have data binding. We have WebSockets. And WebSockets was really the thing that drove me to this in the first place. About four years ago, I started getting involved with WebSocket stuff, initially as sort of a web games thing, but also just because I like things that are overly complicated and pointless. Um, but since then, it's developed into a sort of more interesting thing. And the first thing I want to tell you all about is that unlike common conception, channels is not just WebSockets. It's one of many things in the modern web, and all these things exist today, and there's more coming, that exist that are not just request response. Django and WSGI and a lot of Python web stuff is built around this request response, synchronous, worker pool kind of architecture. And all of these things, like long polling, for example, you cannot do with that because if you have that architecture and you have a long poll that holds open for, say, 30 seconds, then all of your worker threads are just idle for 30 seconds doing nothing. And the same goes for things like server sent events where you hold open things and send multi-part chunks back. So we have all these issues, and we have Django that is very capable at doing normal web pages and has done that very well, but isn't really suited in its current form to these kinds of challenges. And this is down to a couple of key things. The first is very obvious. Python, at least for a long time, was synchronous. Um, it's only been in the last couple of years with the newer Python 3 versions that asynchronous sort of handling and code and the way we can do that's libraries have come to being. And even then, Django is still a synchronous framework. The problem with async libraries in the way that they are best written is that you need an entirely separate API for synchronous and asynchronous libraries. You basically need a whole second standard library. And going back to the thing we heard earlier about Django being the standard library for the web, like, we would have to rewrite most of the important parts of Django to be asynchronous. And so rewriting Django, unless you can find me a team of 10 amazing developers in a couple of years, is probably not going to happen in the near future. And there's more on top of that, too. So while asynchronous code is lovely, um, I would heavily advise you to only write asynchronous code where you have to. I can write it. I try not to whenever I can because it's easy to screw up. It's easy to get horrible mistakes and problems. Deadlocks or live locks abound. Um, synchronous code is easy to think about, easy to reason about. And on top of this, if you think about the true meaning of what it means to be an asynchronous framework or system, often that means like, oh, inside a single process. So say, look at something like um, gevent for Python. It can do lots of green threads in a single process. But once you've got a, web a WebSocket server that's in a single process, what happens when you make it two processes or two servers? How do you extend beyond that machine boundary? And so I was seeing this much more as how do we take this problem of there are these individual units of work and spread them across not just multiple threads or processes, but across a network of machines? Because that's how the modern websites work. We have clusters, we have data centers full of stuff. And finally, important things for sanity it has to be a proven design pattern. Um, I in my younger, more naive years, loved inventing brand new exciting things that didn't work very well. I'm now a bit older and a bit wiser, and things that have been proven to work and have research and have like, write-ups on how to do them is very important. Like, you won't get very far without building on the shoulders of the giants that came before you. 
And so that's a very important thing for me because I don't want to have to do all the years and years of research and testing to prove something works reasonably well. And finally, I had to be able to explain it because it's no good if it's amazing systems, elegant, and one person in the world understands it. And that's the same for your code. Code written in this system should be easy to reason about, easy to think about, easy to sort of like just understand what's going on. So given all these constraints and many more that I'll sort of touch on over the rest of the talk, what fits those constraints? Like this is the thing I sat down a couple of years ago and I had been researching on and off for a few years before that. Like how can we solve this within Django? And one of the big things here is the idea of loose coupling. Now Django, um, I think used to promote on the front page, the idea that Django is like this, this fan of loose coupling. It's a design pattern of the way things are done. And what it means in a couple of ways, well the first thing is it means not being too tied to WebSockets. As I said earlier, they're not the only problem. There's more of a general problem here with the web not being this purely synchronous flow anymore. And also shouldn't be too tied to Django. Django has been, for a long time in the past, this sort of standalone monolith in the Python community. And it's important to have a solution that's a bit more open, a bit more welcoming, and that we can have our friends in the rest of Python help us with. Because there are many people in the rest of Python who are way better than me at networking, and they have their own projects. So having them included is a massive help. And the second part of loose coupling is the idea of the fact that you can swap out components. That there is a well-defined minimal interface that you can take and you can program against, and then if you want to change what's on either side of it, you're free to. And that's kind of a key part of what Django is, right? Like the template system now, you can use Django templates, but if you want to, you can just pop Ginger in there. It's not too difficult. You've got to rewrite the templates, but it's an option we give you. And Django has this philosophy of, you build on Django to start with, and as you grow, pieces fall away, and you can replace them with your own piece, with your own thing. But at any given point, it's a slow, gradual process. Like Django is modular; you can pick and choose what you want. So, let's look at a proven design pattern first. Um, there's not many options for talking between machines. There's been a lot of research into it, and the one I have had a lot of positive experience with, and generally prefer, is the message bus. So the message bus is the idea where you have a single centralized bus. It could be a server, it could be a cluster, it could even just be a file. But it's a single place you point every server or every process to. In particular, what you don't do is that none of the processes know where the other ones are. All they talk to is the bus. And you put something on the bus with an address. You say, hey, send this to, and you give a name. And then something else can listen and say, hey, I want things for the name. And it delivers them across. This is a heavily proven thing in research. It has some issues, but it's always trade-offs with large system design. You have to trust me on that in some sense. And so that's kind of the basis why I sort of started off. And like, there's some good solutions there. And then the question is, well, OK, you have a message bus. Clearly, you send messages over it. But what do the messages look like? Like, how are you encoding things? If we're going to do WebSockets, what does that mean? And secondly, as well, like, you have a bus, but how do you talk to it? What does that interface look like? So, you know, how do you send it? And this is the basis of what Channels is. Channels is rooted in a specification called ASGI, which stands for the Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface. Definitely not based on WSGI, definitely not the case. And what this is, is a specification for both of those things, both how you talk to the message bus and how you send things over it. So this is the five functions of how you talk to that message bus. You can send and receive, and in particular, the send is always non-blocking, and the receive is blocking or polling, you get to choose. And so that's how you sort of do your basic communication. And then the second part is a group system. And this is the key difficult part of the problem, because doing messages between different machines is not too difficult. You can do it pretty easily. But having a broadcast system that works across a network is, is a difficult problem. And so that's baked into the very core of channels, is part of this specification and part of the thing that gets implemented is the idea of a group. You have a group, you can add and remove channels from that group, and then you can send to the group and all the channels in the group get the message. And this is a very simple basic broadcast system, but it's enough of that minimal interface that you can build on top of it. And then, what are the messages? Well, the actual semantics, the thing inside them, is defined in a little bit, but like, in terms of a format, what's the restriction? Is it binary? Is it text? Is it just numbers? Is it Morse code? 
Um, and what we ended up with, what I ended up with was it is a JSON compatible, as in it only uses the types that JSON can represent, dictionary based format, as in the top level is always a Python dictionary, um, text encoded message onto the channel. And in the API that you have in ASGI, all you do is send and receive dictionaries with these basic types in them. The encoding, the serialization is all done for you by the layer underneath. And that pluggable layer, the thing underneath those five functions, is one of the swappable components. Oh, apparently I'm a very um, excitable speaker and that pushed the force of this away. That's fine. Are we okay? Yes, excellent. Um, and so that, you know, that's part of the specification that you can swap out. Like if you want to encode things as JSON, you can. If you want to use message pack, you can do that as well. The key thing, as long as you stick to this interface and provide dictionaries out to Python, it doesn't care. And so let's dig in a bit more with an example because talking in abstract is very difficult with this kind of thing. Um, I prefer using very concrete examples for things so that you have an idea of what's going on. And so let's look at WebSockets. If you're not familiar, they are a stateful socket that basically it starts off as a HTTP connection and then you send a header saying, I actually wanted to upgrade to WebSocket and then if it supports it, the server back, sends back, okay, and then it's sort of the, the nice text part vanishes, it turns into binary and then frames start happening. But essentially you've got a couple of different parts of the life cycle. You have a connection phase and in the connection phase the client talks to the server, says, I'd like to open a socket, my origin is this, I'm coming from this frame, and then the server gets to go either, no, we're denying the connection based on security or overbearing, sort of overloading policies, or it gets to say, yes, I accept this, it sends a handshake back and they negotiate and open. Once you've opened, you can send and receive in other direction. You can send or receive whenever you like, as many times as you like, you can just wait, you can open a socket and then leave it open for a day and then send one thing and close it. That's perfectly acceptable. You can open a socket and then just receive things down it and then close it. There's no particular ordering there at all. And then finally, at the end of the life of a socket, it disconnects. And there is a thing in the, so in the spec that says, when you disconnect, there is a code, a bit like the HTTP error code that says why. It's like code 1005 means it closed unexpectedly, for example. And so this is kind of the, the framework of, of what the sockets is as a protocol. And the job is, how do we take this protocol as an abstract concept and map it into what channels is? And this kind of is part of the design of channels. What you do is, because you have this messaging system, you have this bus, what we're doing is devolving protocols into a series of events. And what happens is for each one of those events, you send a message onto the message bus, under a certain named channel. So, for example, here are those three. It, when the connection happens, a message gets sent onto websocket.connect. When a message comes in from the client, it gets under websocket.receive. And when somebody disconnects, it goes into websocket.disconnect. And what's happening is, on one end of that message bus, there is a server sitting there terminating the sockets. It's a separate process, and it's handling that sort of, all the handshaking, all the decoding for you, and just turning it into these nice messages onto the bus. And then your job as a Django program is to receive those messages and, and act upon them. But of course, to act upon them, you need to do things the other way. Like you see here, the arrows go both ways on the slide. And so what you have to do is you have to send back to that socket on a channel as well. And so not only do you send from the client to the server on these connection, receive, disconnection channels, you also send back from the server to the client on a special channel. Now, you may notice there is a different kind of formatting on this channel, and there's a good reason for that. So if we look at the idea of how this bus might be laid out in a bigger system, let's say here's one. So we have two of these separate servers, and both of these servers, imagine like, like G-Unicorn or Nginx, like a separate process um, that terminates WebSockets. The socket goes into there, it gets terminated, decoded, parsed, and then all that comes out of that is events onto the message bus. Separately, you have a couple of Django worker processes listening on that bus for channels they're configured to work on, and then when they get a message, they go, oh, wake up, take the message, run the code that you've written for them, send things back, and go back again. Now, when someone connects or sends a message in, any of these Django processes can handle it. They all have the same code, in theory. And so what we can say is, well, we'll just send on to the connection channel, and whoever's ready can pick it up and go with it. It's great, that's how general worker pool handling works, it's fantastic. But when you send something back, you can't just say, oh, send this back, either server can handle it, 
because the socket is only on one of those servers. The client has a TCP connection to just one of those two processes. So you have to route back that socket to the particular process that has it. And that's kind of a distinction we have inside channels. You have these top set, which are general, world routable, anyone can handle them channels. And when you have an exclamation mark, it means no, this channel has a specific process that's trying to look out for it and receive it, and exactly that process can handle it. And that's in there so that the, the message bus implementation can actually handle them in different ways for more optimal performance. It can understand that, oh, if I see this character, I can actually do a different kind of routing for it. And all this comes down to, if I tell you there's a message bus, the first question you should ask is, well, what are the trade-offs? Because any, any distributed system has a set of trade-offs. If somebody tells you their system is perfect, they are lying to you. They should not do this to you at all. Um, and so there are a series of trade-offs. The first one is, how does delivery fail? So say I send a message and the system is in a non-perfect state, what happens to my message? You have two options. Either the message doesn't deliver, or the message delivers more than once. And the architecture, you can imagine, there's different ways. Like, you know, not delivering is pretty easy. It just drops in the network somewhere. But you can have systems too. Um, Kafka is a good example of this, where in a failure state, you'll get multiple duplicates of the message. That's their failure state. You never get, you get at least one. Um, channels is an at most once system, where you get the message at most once. So it means either you get it or it drops. This is generally a lot easier to reason about, um, and off, often how you design websites in the first place. Um, it is also first in, first out. That means if you send a message onto a channel and then another message onto the channel, the first one there gets handled first. This is a queue versus stack distinction you may, if you've done computer science, you may have heard of already. You then have things like back pressure. So a channel has a capacity. So by default, websocket.connect has a capacity of 100. So if 100 people try and connect and the server is behind, the 101st connection event tries to get added in and send goes, whoa, the channel is full. And then what that means is it tells the, the thing that's handling the socket, oh, well, the back-end system is full and overloaded. I should drop this connection and send back an error code saying, oh, 503 or 501, the system isn't working very well. Please come and try again later. There's a few other things to highlight as well. Um, because of the way it's designed, it's not sticky. When you have all these different workers listening on a channel, any one of them could get that particular message at a time, whoever's ready and gets it first. And so if you have a socket that opens and it goes, oh, connect, receive, 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 disconnect, it might be a series of events you have on the channel, that could go to five different servers. And in fact, it could go to different servers and happen at the same time. You could have connect and then receive, receive, it gets handled by two different servers simultaneously and in parallel with each other. And this is hard to reason about. So that's kind of an annoying thing of this architecture. And as I said, it's a trade-off. If you want, you can have both of these things. You can have guaranteed ordering, you can have serial processing, and you'll have a massive speed drop as a result. But we'll come to some of those in a second. So let's look at what they actually look like, these messages. Well, here's an example receive message. When you have an open WebSocket, someone sends you a, a frame. Now, WebSockets are a framed protocol. That means that you get distinct sets of data, so like as a chunk, and they can be either text or they can be bytes, basically binary. So imagine someone sends in a text frame, so it comes into this, to this server that's on the edge of the network, has, a, has the socket tied to it. That server goes, OK, decodes the binary frame into reasons. And then goes, OK, well, that's a text frame. So it sends this message. So the first part you can see here is that, yes, it is a text frame. There is a text part of this message that says, text, hello world. That's what we got sent. And the second two part, well, the last two parts of this are the metadata. And they tell the server what this means, because in this system I showed you before, it's an entirely shared nothing system. This is great for scaling, because you can just launch more of them. But what it means is that none of the workers keep any state or know about each other. And so your only way of understanding that these things are part of the same socket is to have something in there that says, oh no, these all come from the same socket. And what we do is we reuse that channel that you send things back to it on as the identifier. So the reply channel here is both the way of sending things back to the socket. So you can say, oh, I'll take that and send something back to the person. But also your way of saying, oh, this is the same socket as that one I saw three seconds ago that had the same reply channel. And you can use this as a key in another data store, say a cache or a database, to tie those things together. Much like you would with a cookie, for example, in, in Django. And finally, you have a path. And this comes in, as we'll see in the routing later in the talk. But 
when you have in Django code that handles these messages, there's kind of a URL-like structure in there where you say, oh, well, for things under this path, do this, and things on this path, do this. Because they can only work on things in the message, what we do is we bundle the path in with the message when it comes through. Um, we don't bundle like, the headers or anything else, just the path. And this is a, a sort of later addition onto the thing, but it, it's very useful, as you'll see later. And this is not just WebSocket. So, as I said before, you can take a protocol, you can decompose it into events, and you can say, well, what does this mean? How do we approach this in this event-driven system? Like, you know, it's an event-driven system where all you can do is write code that happens against things that happen in the protocol. And so we have a full spec with proper, like, musts and shoulds and everything for HTTP and for WebSocket. So you saw there part of the WebSocket spec. I'll just go forward here. Um, this is an example HTTP um, connection in this case. So for the HTTP, you get a request channel, and then you send back in a response channel. It's, it's very simple, but it still fits the same model. And so see here, you get like, well, here's our reply channel to send our response back on. But familiar things like the method and the path and the query string are all here. And in fact, this is just a so, sort of superset of what WSGI provides, so it's sort of intercompatible as well. But it's not just web stuff. Um, you can also apply this to other protocols. Um, we have rough drafts and people looking at and interested in working on um, both IRC and Slack as messaging protocols. So the idea being that you could write a chatbot where, well, it, things appear on the chat.receive channel and you can just write code that acts on received messages and just send them out in the same framework. There's an email rough draft I've been working on where you could write things that handle incoming email in the same framework. Where you go, okay, well, we have a message on the email received channel. Let's look at it. It has these headers. We can respond in the same way. Um, you could do, in theory, any protocol. Um, two I have done in the past and recommend you never do. Um, Minecraft, which is uh, you have to do special Java-only serialization in Python. I have a whole library for that if you're interested. Um, <laughs> and uh, screen scraping mainframe terminals over serial connections. Both possible, don't do them. Um, but in general, like, there's more sp uh, like, we're trying to expand the number of sort of specs just as a health measure to see if we can do them, but try and get a few more things than just these top two in there. And going back to this list again, so I highlighted these two earlier, and they are problematic because WebSockets are an ordered set of frames that you expect it to handle basically one after the other. And so, it's not a great user experience if I tell you, oh, it's fine, just make your code so it works perfectly run one in parallel on five machines at once and handles ordering all the wrong... You, no. As I said at the beginning, writing asynchronous code is hard. And so what we've done is as part of the spec where actually those received messages have a fourth key, they have an order key, and that key tells you, oh, this was message number five. And the second part of it is that what we can do is we can use that order number and then we can use the reply channel with a caching store and just have the system tell you, and it's built into channels as you'll see, oh, enforce ordering on this, on this channel. And what it'll do is it'll trade off some speed. Obviously, you lose some speed to the synchronization and the collaboration algorithm, but you do get your things executed perfectly serially in order. So if you want it, you can do that trade off yourself with a single decorator we have for you and just have it work. And the second thing that is, in fact, a very recent development in channels is that what we've done is rather than before, where you'd connect to the server, it would negotiate and then send a connect message, and then, and then it, would just, it would just always accept, and then just start sending receive messages. What we've changed now is that it does a connect message, and then it holds the socket in the handshaking phase, sends to your application and says, hey, do you want to accept this or reject this? And once you've sent back and said to reject, then it continues to either open the socket or close it. And what this does is give you implicit ordering of the connect always comes before your first receive. And that's the most common problem people had. So it's kind of hard to understand all of this. And as I said, I need a few hours. So let's go through some of the components of this system. So I've been talking about the server that terminates and the stuff in channels. So this is the five packages that currently make up the channels project. There is channels, the eponymous package that is the Django integration that ties ASGI, the thing I've been telling you about, into a nice Django-ish framework, and we'll get to that in a second. But there's also the other parts of what makes ASGI run. The Django part is just one, of the whole, one part of the whole system. There's also the central part, the message bus. Like, there has to be a piece of code that plugs in and does all this delivery for you. And the idea is it's a bit like um, DBAPI2 in Python, like the sort of common database interface where there's a series of pluggable things for whatever you feel like doing. So there is a Redis backend, which uses Redis for delivery. 
There is an IPC one, which uses shared memory segments, if you want to be more one machine. Um, there is an in-memory one for testing. And we actually have some people looking at writing one on RabbitMQ as well now as well. So the idea is you to choose from this set of options based on your deployment, your, your experience. Maybe you have some of these deployed already. Um, but if you, whatever you want to fix your situation, you can have that particular delivery mechanism. And if you want, it's not a very long spec. If you have a person on a team who really likes asynchronous code, let them write one um, that fits your scheme or fits your custom networking protocol, and that works as well. And then finally, on the other end of all of this, is the mystical server that turns WebSockets into events, and that is called Daphne. Um, Daphne is a, basically, I took Twisted and Autobahn, two excellent pieces of code, put some hot glue in the middle, and then just tacked on ASG on the back of them. Um, all it does, it uses, it uses the Twisted web standard HTTP handling library, um, Autobahn, which is a very well-proven WebSocket library, and then just takes all the things where you plug in, like where you handle those, and just puts in send to the channel there instead. And whenever it gets received from channel, it just then, then responds onto the socket. And that server is the thing that handles taking these connections and turning them into events on the channel for you. If you want, you can just run Daphne. It will handle HTTP and WebSockets on the same socket. It will auto-negotiate now this path prefixing stuff you may have seen. But if you want, you can also just run your standard Nginx or GUnicorn on one side, and then just send WebSockets to Daphne if you'd like as well. So I mentioned previously, the channels is the Django-ish part. So let's go into some deep detail on that Django-ish part. That's kind of what you're here for. So crucially, I want to highlight that what is here has been a lot of revisions. It takes a lot of tries to get a nice API. It's still not fully there yet, um, although it's most of the way there now. And so what is here is based on a lot of thought and like what feels Django-ish. Nothing is, there's no specification for what is Django-ish. There's not a big list the core team have, has of like, oh, well, it means this, 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 and this, stamp of approval. That's not how it works. It's more sort of a nuanced thing of like, well, what feels good for the users? What matches expectations? What's not surprising? What's boring? Boring is good in Django world. And so the first thing is, well, everything every Django developer does is write views. We're all written views. They're great. So what if the fundamental unit of work in channels looked basically like a view. That was my sort of guiding principle of this project. So consumers are the things that you write against these channels, and they look like views. Here is the code. Um, what happens is you write a callable that takes a single thing. So it's not a request, it's a message, but it's very similar. You do some stuff with the thing you got given, and then you can send responses back. There's a couple of differences. So first of all, you can send responses anywhere in the consumer. It's not a return, like it is with a view. Um, you get that reply channel back in the message. So as you can see here, you have both message.replyChannel.send, in which case, what this does, it, this is tied to a, so to, a, to a channel. It gets the message. It then says, OK. It sends the message text OK on the reply channel of the message. Then it uses the group system. Now, this is just a very concise example. But say, in the connect handler, we said, oh, when someone connects, here's a consumer that says, add them to this group. And when someone receives a message, here's a consumer that says, send to this group. Ta-da, you've got a chat application. Like, those two things give you broadcast text chat between all the clients connected. Or you can just do RM things. You can do whatever you like. It's a normal Django process. The normal Django database cleaning applies. If you want, you can wrap transactions around in there. It's just basically like a view, but a bit more complicated. And that kind of ties in also with the way the routing works. Now, I like the Django URL system. It has its problems, but it is, I've grown to know and love it, maybe over a little bit of uh, Stockholm Syndrome over the past 10 years. And so keeping it to look like that is kind of important. And so what you have is you have this list, sound familiar, of regex-based matches of what to do. So imagine this example. You have basically a list of, well, this channel, in this case, websocket.receive, and if the path is chat socket, send to this function. You can include, like in URLs, and even like in the URLs file, if you include with a regex path, then that bit's stripped from the, previous one, from the next one down. So you can say, oh, this prefix goes to this file, and then you just not have the prefix in the file at all. And the nice thing is, as well, you can have class-based consumers in the same way you can have class-based views. And as well as having everything sort of more generic, and there's a set of generic class-based consumers as well, um, those consumers can, in fact, emit their own routes. Because in particular, the one change you see here from URLs is that URLs don't have a channel. In URLs, everything is on the HTTP request channel. 
And so this has a little extra information. And so what we can do is those class-based consumers can tell the URL file, oh no, I need these three channels. And the root class decorator takes that information from the class and uses it for you. So there's no duplication of content in this file. Um, and so as I said before, it is a shared nothing system. These things could happen on different machines, in different parts of the world even, if you have a weird message bus set up. And so how do you share state? How do I have a thing where I can send a message over the uh, socket to set my username and then have another message come through and then that remembers my name and comes back again? So you could use a database. Databases are great. Um, but you can also use sessions. And we all love sessions. They're a good temporary storage. And there are two kinds of sessions and channels. There's the good old-fashioned session you know and love from HTTP, from the cookie. And what happens is when you open a socket, it's very convenient because it starts HTTP, the cookie comes through in that initial connection request. So we can actually take the session from the real site, drag it through into the WebSocket framework, and then stash it. But where do we stash it? Because, of course, that connection handler is on one of the machines. Where does it store the cookie for the rest of the, rest of the thing? And so there's also a second kind of session called a channel session. And that channel session is basically your state for the lifetime of a socket. So imagine if you were writing a simple application in Python, you use local variables for this, right? Like, oh yeah, have a handler or a thread, it's in there. Instead, the channel session is a place where you can put things that happen during the socket and for the socket only. Like, oh, when someone connects, set their username, set their permissions, and that kind of thing. So that gives you sort of your general over the lifetime set of what you can do with the socket. And this is one of the things that powers the enforce ordering thing I mentioned about before. So, you know, I said you can take a socket and you can enforce ordering on it using these sessions. And what this does is this decorator, which ships with channels, just looks at the message, uses the channel session and says, OK, I have packet number five. Has pa what was the last packet handle packet number four? And at the end of the decorator, it says, I just handled packet number four and writes it into the channel session. So what you get is you get the thing where the first thing, so it's like, you know, packet number one just runs, doesn't look for anything. It says, okay, number one runs, saves number one to the session, then number two goes, oh, number one's been run, and it can then pick up and do it again and keep going. How this works, a little bit of in, in, interior information here. So inside the loop, or sorry, inside the decorator even that runs this, this is the sort of code we have. So this is in particular the session decorator to give you channel sessions. So the Django session framework, if you've ever used it, is interesting and quite old by now. Um, and it kind of wants to do its own thing. Like the session framework goes, OK, here's your session key. Put this in a cookie. Now, we can't do that. There's no cookies in WebSockets. Or you can receive them, but you can't set them. So what we do is we go, no, 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 no. Here's the key. Deal with it. Um, and the key is made using a predictive hash from that reply channel, you know, that identifier that we have for every channel. And so we take that, res that, that identifier. This first function on the slide here basically takes a reply channel name, hashes it, then forces the session framework to look up by key, and you get back a session. And then the second part says, well, OK, we have a session. We need to make sure it's saved, so it actually exists in the database first, so there's no collisions. And then when it's saved, it can then pass it back and continue. Now, the one interesting thing here is there is a raise consume later. The way that channels works is that it is a separate worker loop from Django. So normal Django runs inside a WSGI container most of the time. That handles your loop and your requests. Because channels run separately as a separate process, it has its own loop. It has a thing called run worker that happens and sits there and just spins around handling stuff. And the flow of that is, well, it looks for all the channels it can listen on, so connect and receive and disconnect, it just says, give me any message from any of these channels that arrives first. And then the loop goes, OK, I've got this thing. It then looks in the routing to try and find the right consumer, finds it, then just runs the consumer, and then just finishes, and then loops back around to the beginning again. But in there, inside that code, there's a little thing that says, ah, but if the consumer throws the exception consume later, take the message, put it on the back of the queue, and continue. And so this is your way we can go, eh, I don't want to handle this one just yet. And you can put it back on. There's a couple of these exceptions inside channels, sort of a bit like control flow, like, oh, throw this away, consume it later, and sort of a bit more of that worker loop that we now have in place. Uh, there is no middleware. And this is a somewhat controversial thing. Um, some issues recently over this. So middleware is great. I agree with this. I love middleware. However, middleware is built with a thing where the request flows in through the middleware, 
the response flows out through the middleware. Now, because of the way consumers are written, which I'll remind you is like this, um, you don't return the response, you send it via a couple of different functions. You can do a group send, you can do a reply channel set, you, know, you can just send to an arbitrary channel name if you want to. And so what that means is you can't capture those easily at all, and so your middleware can't do the exit portion. And so for that reason, right now my position is decorators replace most of the cases of middleware, and they are more obvious because with decorators you, go, you, you look at your consumer and go, oh, there's a decorator right there. I know that's being applied. With middleware, it's hidden away in another file. And I personally like explicit discoverable interfaces. I may eventually concede on this at some point, but right now, there is no middleware. It's all decorators. And things like you know, authentication and sessions are all handled in decorators. Those things are there for you. And now, you may think, that, well, Andrew, what about the rest of Django that still exists? That's still there. Django views are still there. Django, HTTP is all, all well and good. Um, but the fun thing is, because what I described is a superset of what Django does now, it actually builds into the current system. The entirety of Django as you know it now is a single consumer inside channels. It's called the view consumer. If you want to, you can just route request to it and they'll come through the view system, do URL routing, come out the back with a response on it, handle onto it. And this means that inside channels, you can just, if you want to, mix and match HTTP handling with, so let's say, long polling, which you can't do inside views. So, oh yeah, well, in my routing, if it's on the long poll path, send it after this special consumer of HTTP. If it's on the WebSocket path, do it over here. And then finally, if you want to, and this is on by default, just drop down to the Django view system. And this way you can mix and match different kinds of even HTTP handling and WebSocket handling with standard Django views. This is what that consumer looks like in very modified, small format. It's really about 20 lines of code. Um, but essentially, what it does is, right now inside Django, there's, there's a thing called WSGI Handler. That is a piece of code where you go, OK, here is my application. You load it in, then you, then you just call it, because WSGI, you call and get a response. And it, you call it, and it gives you a response. Same thing applies here. There's an AirGI Handler that can decode things from a message rather than WSGI environment variables. So we use that, and then we just take the replies, and then we just send the replies to the reply channel, and then handle them off. The one difference here is you can see another one of those exceptions. As I said before, channels have capacity. So imagine you're streaming a very large file to a client, and they've got a very slow downlink. They won't be able to receive the messages as fast as you're sending them. And we don't want the channel layer to have to sit there absorbing 100 megabytes of file into whatever buffer it has, and then doing it down again. And so what we have is, again, if the channel is full, in this case, rather than disconnecting, we just wait. We stop the iteration. And in particular, if you have like a chunk response or a yielding response, this works as you'd expect, where it pauses in that yield. And just waits. And then when the channel is empty again, it goes, OK, it's empty again, and continues going through. So you can do stream responses in the same fashion you can with WSGI. Finally, in sort of the slightly quick whistle-stop tour of this, there are more signals than commands. So inside Django, you have a couple of important signals. Um, response started and response finished, in particular, are your life cycle of how response works. And a lot of Django is built around, well, when the response starts, do some stuff. When the response finishes, clean up some stuff so the next response is done. In particular, closing database connections is done in the response or request finished handler. So Channels introduces new signals. So the old ones are still in there for the view system, but there's also a consumer started and consumer finished signal. And what it does, it ties in database cleaning to consumer finish as well. So your consumers won't leak database handles. Um, and it also overrides run server. So run server bundles in Daphne and runs everything. So run server just has WebSockets now, just works as you want. And then finally, things like static files, which have like special development overrides in Django. Um, you may not know this, but when you run run server, a piece of code flips on and says, oh, in debug mode, override this URL config and in, in, inject static files in the middle of it. And we have to replicate that as well. And then finally, you know, this is what channel is now, but what is, what is in the future for channels? So hopefully you've got some idea of what it is. And kind of what underlies this is a generalized system for communicating between nodes. Um, channels design is perhaps not surprisingly based on CSP, a language I was taught at university for proving asynchronous and distributed systems. Um, it is the idea that you can have a message passing system and that's how you can reason about things and prove things and prove deadlocks. 
And what I've tried to make a system that is not just for handling WebSockets, but for handling generalized asynchronous problems in a larger system. Now, websites aren't just HTML anymore. They are different kinds of problems, different kinds of systems. You might have MQTT, which is an Internet of Things binary protocol for reporting sensor data. The Internet of Things is growing. It's kind of part of the web as well. We should be able to handle that kind of thing. And so what I'm trying to lay here is not only a good Django thing that looks like Django and feels like Django, but also an underlying system for Django and your wider projects and maybe the wider projects of Python in general for how do I write different processes to talk to each other in a way I can reason about effectively. And it's also not even for that inside Django. Um, you know, you can do, say you've got microservices. How do you send things to microservices? Ta-da, channels. Um, you can do that. You can do things like separating things by CPU. Like, so you say, oh, I want to run all the thumbnailing on this machine for these channels. I want to run all the things that are, have my signing keys on this one machine in a, locked in a closet behind 25 gates. Um, if you want, you can, have, you can mix different Python versions. Um, this is a way to convert part of your site to Python 3. Because you can say, oh, well, these consumers run on Python 3, and the rest of the site runs on Python 2. And of course, you can run different parts sync and async. Underlying channels is the fact that what I've done is I've kept Django synchronous. Django still runs fully synchronous in a worker loop. And you still have all the things and all the same guarantees you had Django before. And all the asynchronous stuff is kept in a separate process where if you want to, you can go and play with that. I, I recommend reading up before you do. It's asynchronous stuff is horrible, and WebSocket is definitely so. Um, but it keeps them apart. And if you want to, you can write your own synchronous processes, your own asynchronous processes, and, and tie them into that bigger system. Or you can just be like what I want to be and ignore it and be happy and just go, I can write synchronous code. This is great. And, and part of this is, you know, Channels is still a young project, especially by Django standards. And a big part of it is diversity of implementations. So I mentioned before, there are th currently three different channel layers. Um, there is a conformance test suite as well. I mentioned that. I quite like those in specifications. Um, and a fourth one, hopefully being worked on very soon. And that's kind of part of proving this is like, I want at least two production-ready channel layers. Um, only one of them, the Redis one, is currently cross-network. I want at least two web servers that support this specification. You know, having Daphne is great, but the Django project is not really in the business of running a web server as well. Um, so you know, talking to other servers, you know, trying to get them to integrate support as well, and having that be part of a wider push. And more optimization, like channels is not the best at having lots and lots and lots of channels being listened on, because it sends them every, every request. It's not particularly good at bulk sending to groups. Both of these are solvable problems. And so you know, I believe in getting it right first and fast second. So you know, we're right and a little bit fast, but there's a lot of room there to get it faster and hopefully match or exceed the speed of current Django. Because um, at some point, I would like to have it be a no-brainer of like, oh, we should run everything via this rather than just have sort of a split whiskey thing. And also, finally, more maintainers. Like, I am, in many ways, the person who talks a lot about channels. Um, I was very great, grateful that there were a couple of other talks at DjangoCon US this year that talked about it. Um, but there are not that many people helping me to maintain the core project as it is stands right now. And channels has a lot of problems that are fresh and range from easy to solve to almost impossible to solve, depending on how you're feeling. Um, but also, um, we have, still have Mozilla funding, thanks to the very generous Mozilla program that I applied for after this conference last year, and then they just gave us some money to build this. So if you are at all interested in channels and want to help do a few bugs, or write some documentation, or write a tutorial, or write some examples up, or fix some horrific, nasty, like reality-tearing things in the middle of it, all those are possible. Please just come and talk to me, and I'd ha happily talk you through some of this stuff. And finally, channels have been going for a while. Um, I am very close to calling what we have 1.0. It's not quite there yet. Um, you, you may not be aware, but channels over the summer became an official Django project. So it's now at github.com slash Django slash channels. And so soon we reach a stable stage where you can run the API properly. It's not going to change much anyway. It's pretty stable as it is. And then from there, like plan more like what is the future and maybe sort of start moving towards more of a date-based release system like Django has as well. And with that, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Andrew. Predictably, we have a lot of questions. Oh, great. How many hours have we got left? Oh. Uh, according to the schedule, we have four minutes. OK, um, right. But that's mostly my fault for running over. So we'll, we'll run slightly over, because there's a lot of interesting questions. Um, let's start off with something relatively straightforward. What are some sort of common use cases you can think of for why you would want to start writing channels? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So. Not everyone has a need to write channel stuff. Um, in particular, WebSockets are still somewhat new, and not everyone wants to use them. So I would say that if you have any part of the site that currently uses long polling or sort of any kind of polling or any kind of live data, that's an obvious first choice. Um, what I'm looking to do, actually, in, in the near future is implement something like SockJS, which is a, a layer that sort of encompasses long polling and sockets for like fallback purposes. And so what you can do is, oh, we'll just use the existing JavaScript that somebody else is writing with the spec they have, plug it into Django, and then you can have easy live data on your site straight away. And a lot of more rich web apps want that kind of stuff. So that's a good first case, I would say. Cool. So if you want to get involved with channels, is there like an equivalent of the Django tutorial yet? Is that a work in progress? So there is a getting started guide. Um, the documentation, which is linked right here, um, has a sort of, it, there's a sort of a first document that goes through the concepts in a sort of a more proper way than I have here on stage. And then the second document is a sort of a basic tutorial about, well, let's write a consumer, let's fiddle with HTTP responses, let's see what happens. It's not as good as, the, as any, any of the tools we have in Django, but it is a good start. Um, I would love to see that improved if you're interested in helping out there as well. So having gone through those documents at some point and built my own little channels testing thing, this is a question I'm particularly fond of. Why did channel pass start with a slash? Wait, are we meaning the URL routing? In the URL routing section. So the reason they start it with a slash, so if you're not familiar, let's, get, let's go back to the slide here. Um, oh, that's a good, good thing. So uh, paths in channels start with a slash. In URLs and Django, they don't. The reason for this is this actually is not URL routing. It is routing on attributes in the message. It happens that all the messages have a path in them and that you can use that. But you can also do method. Like if these are HTTP, you could do method there. You could do reply channel, you could do anything you like, header-based header routing. It's because it's not just URLs. I did want to put a special casing for, well, if the name they look for is called path, then strip the first slash. So this is more of a, it's a general code rather than a URL code thing. So, I mean, there's a dep in progress at the moment about URL routing and improving that system yes. in general. Do you think that this or more of an advanced system that you built might be applicable to reworking Django's own URL Yeah, I, I would love to see the two of them come together as one system. I think having, like, you know, I had to write a, but basically a brand new one because the current one is not very flexible, but hopefully we could fix all of that in a new rewrite and have the same system share between both of them with a flag that says, starts with a slash, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> How is this different to, um, to Celery or sort of quote unquote normal message queuing? Right. So Celery is a task queue. In particular, it is for offloading things to be done at some point in the future. Um, channels is a high-speed, um, basically, like communication layer. So latency is a big difference, as well as so, chat, so Celery is reliable and trustworthy. And if you put a message on there, it's probably going to get delivered. Channels is, and, but it might take like you know a second or half a second to get there. Um, channels is, you know, under a millisecond, really quick, designed for a very rapid chat. And so they're different kinds of systems. They both are kind of message buses, but you know. Many things are the same underneath. Um, for example, I would say sending an email is probably best done via Celery if it's important, because Celery has more guarantees. But something like running some stats code is probably better done via a background channels task, because it's much lighter weight. So there's a kind of a, a sort of a balance there between different design patterns. Um, I guess kind of building on from that, if you're going to do some things in the background like that, is there a way of making sure that particular connections or particular channels or so on are only handled by you know, certain parts of your system so that you could load balance, you can run it all in one system, but you can load balance your different areas independently. Yeah, so that is definitely in there. So the command you run to run a Django process, which is called run worker, um, there are options on that to say, you can say like, oh, only run this pattern of channels, so like only run web, like websocket.star, um, or don't run these channels, don't run HTTP.star. And so like, if you want, you can balance the process and say, oh, this process handles everything but this channel and sort of load balance that way. It's like, oh, these servers have more RAMs, we'll put thumbnailing over here, and then we'll put queuing over here, and we'll put handling over there. So you have that kind of flexibility in there. Thank you. Um, has the HTTP over channels been load tested? Do we know whether this is better, worse than whatever than the situation we've got? It has, thanks to one of our um, people who signed up to do some help. It has been load tested. It came out very slightly slower than G Unicorn. 
which, as far as I'm concerned, is not bad, considering. Um, and it's mostly because you know, we are taking the request, re-encoding it, sending it over a network, de-encoding it, and, and doing handling on it again. So it is a bit slower. I would love to see that equivalent speed, at least in a sort of similar configuration. Um, it also isn't as great at, so let's say you're like, like a thousand simple test connections, it doesn't handle that as well yet either. So there's room for improvement there. But I, I fully believe it could get as, as good as that. Um, if you're looking at the performance of it, what profiling tools do we have available for distributed systems like this? How do we track how long it actually takes for a message to come in, go on the message bus, get processed, get sent out to something else? How do we profile the system? We have disturbingly few tools for this. Um, so for HTTP, you can obviously use one of the standard HTTP, HTTP benchmarking tools. For WebSockets, there is um, one from the Node community we've been using. There's also one I've written as well, which is a bit, a bit more sort of, it's a bit more mean, sort of like throws in like random non-UTF-8 bytes and then changes the order around and tries to sort of screw, uh, see if they come back in the right order and stuff like that. But a lot of those, like part of this optimization is writing those tools, writing that sort of metric stuff to hook in and go like, well, what is the latency inside the ASGI layer? What is the end-to-end -end latency of the whole system? Like, is it slow in one direction? Like, that needs a lot of work. So debug toolbar for ASCII. Yeah, it's on, it's on the GitHub issue list. Like, there's one that says debug, debugging things for ASGI. Yeah. Um, within the spec, is there the capacity that it could, at some point, have a at least at least once mode instead of an at most once mode? Um, and which, uh, how many components are there that work on, this, work on this principle? Could there be a different version of swapping some of those things, things in? Yeah, so it's not part of the system necessarily. Um, at most once is a part of, it's a guarantee that you have to code against. And so it's the way things are designed. You could do it, you could reuse the existing layers and interfaces, but all the code on top, so all the decorators, all of your consumers, would have to be rewritten. So you know, imagine you have a, a site that expects failure. So right now, channels expects failure, it's built into it, like the session handling cleans up after a while because it expects failure. And now you have to deal with duplicates. So now you need a, well, what happens if we send the same response back to the client twice? Do we need to write new client-side code to dedupe things? Do we have a dedupe store locally to handle this stuff? So like, it's possible, and a lot of the same things apply. It's just like one of those base decisions that if you flip it, you change the universe of code that comes after it. So maybe you could, and certainly you could just write a layer that did that, but you wouldn't be able to reuse a lot of the existing code. So I had a, a bunch of related questions around the choice of particular things. The, you know, there's lots of different place, things that you can use for a transport layer. Of course. There's lots of different um, infrastructure stuff that you could feed into this at the front end. Yes. You know, if you've got a uh, Slack input or whatever, is this expected that you'd need, what would be the process of implementing one of those? Right. And kind of related to that, what should you, what do you currently recommend that you use as your default stack to run this thing on? Of course. So what you have is basically you have a, a what's called a protocol server. And that's, that's the server that sits between the internet and the protocol you're handling, so be it Slack or IRC or HTTP. And then that talks to the ASGI backend and the channel layer are behind it. And so for each of the things you want to talk to, you need one of those. So if you were doing a Slack integration, you'd write a Slack protocol server that sat there with its own process, with its own async framework that opened, I think, I think they have WebSockets and HTTP API for Slack, that opens those connections and does all that stuff for you. Um, but the other part of it also is writing a spec because, I mean, you don't have to, but I highly recommend that you write a specification that you code the protocol server against. And that's kind of part of what I'm trying to do with email and that kind of stuff as well. As for the default stack, right now, personally, I would run um, Daphne for WebSockets only and then route WSGI stuff, or sorry, HTTP stuff to a WSGI server. So what you can do, you have Nginx, you can do a path separation and say, this path goes to this backend, this path goes to GUnicorn, that's how I would run it. Um, my personal site actually runs just in full Daphne mode because there's nothing important on there. Um, but once it hits 1.0 and we get a bit more stable, I would start recommending just run the whole thing through Daphne. And hopefully in future I can then say, or server X also has this support for this natively. I've been talking with a couple of the maintainers of different Python web servers to try and get that conversation going. Great, thank you. Um, final question, although there are at least a dozen more questions I'll, I could ask. I'll read through them. <laughs> um, so please do go through, go through them all. I'm going to ask this one because it's coming from the live stream. Ooh, hello. Um, <laughs> so how, how do you send a message from a client through the socket to a new route? Um, it's not documented anywhere and 
said question that has so been So how do you send a message from the client? Say that again. So how do you send a message from a client through the socket to a new route? I don't know what they're asking there, I think, is the problem. They need more context. You'll need to go and ask that. Yeah, one, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go in the channel and try and answer that and get some more, some more background on that one. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you.